In this video, we will illustrate how to use Newton's second law to solve problems involving rotational motion. The problem reads as follows. A large vertical wheel can be treated like a disc with a mass of 12.1 kilograms and a radius of 0.752 meters with its axis at the center. A force of 153 newtons is applied to the wheel straight down at a point 0.257 meters to the left of the axis and a force of 121 newtons is applied again straight down at a point 0.655 meters to the right of the axis. And we're asked a number of questions. What is the moment of inertia of the wheel? What is the net torque acting on the wheel, size and direction? And what is the angular acceleration of the wheel? The process for using Newton's second law to solve problems in rotational motion is very similar to the process we used for translational motion with a few additions because we are going to be using torque. But the first step in the process, as it was earlier, is to draw a diagram showing all the forces acting on the object with those forces in their proper places. Now this is an addition to the process. Previously we did not care about exactly where we put the forces in the diagram, but here it's very important for the calculation of torque. And so we draw our diagram here showing the wheel, and there are a total of four forces acting on the wheel. The weight of the wheel, which acts at the center of the wheel, the normal force of the axle holding the wheel in place, the axle pushing up on the wheel and supporting it, that acts here at the center as well. And then the two forces that we're told about, the first force which we label F1 of 153 newtons at a distance which we call R1, 0.257 meters from the center. And over here on the right, we have F2, 121 newtons at a distance R2, 0.655 meters from the center. Again, this is important because we're going to be calculating torques. So with all those forces in place, we move on to the second step, which is to select a coordinate system. Again, this has a special addition for rotational motion. We have our X and Y coordinates here, chosen in the typical fashion. The directions are arbitrary. We choose to call to the right positive, and we call upward positive. But here is an additional notation that we're going to call counterclockwise positive in this problem. This is going to be important because we'll need to assign the proper signs to our torques. Step three is to ask the question, do any forces need to be broken up into components? And if so, we need to draw those components and write out formulas. But in this situation, we can skip step three since all four of our forces are vertical. Now we have an additional step because we're dealing with torque. We must select the axis or the pivot point for the purposes of calculation of torque. And so the uh, most apparent place, the easiest place to put that pivot point, that axis is right here at the center. We could put the axis anywhere that we want, but this positioning of the axis will make our job a lot easier as we shall see shortly. The general strategy is to choose your pivot point at the location with the most unknown forces. Now, having chose our pivot point, we can write out formulas for all of the torques involved. All right, so we have four forces here, and so we have the possibility of four torques. I've listed them here on the side. The torque due to force number one, the torque due to force number two, the torque due to the normal force, and the torque due to the weight force. Looking first at force one, we ask ourselves, what direction will force one cause the wheel to spin? If force one is the only force acting on the wheel, what direction will the wheel spin? And we can see that because of this force, that wheel will spin in the counter clockwise direction. And so we assign the torque from force one a positive sign. 
we look at the formula for torque, and that is FR sine phi, the force times the distance of the force from the axis times the sine of the angle between that force and that distance. In the case of force number one, the size of the force is 153 newtons. The distance of the force from the axis is 0 0.257 new meters. And the angle phi between the force and the distance is going to be 90 degrees. Because that force, as we've said, is straight down. That gives us, since the sine of 90 is 1, that gives us a torque from force number 1 of positive 39.3 newton meters. Again, the positive sign indicating the counterclockwise direction. We look here at force number 2, and we can see that if force number 2 was the only force acting on the wheel, it would cause the wheel to move in a clockwise fashion. And so, due to our sign convention up here, that force is going to have a, a uh, cause a negative torque. The uh, force in question is 121 newtons. The distance is 0 0.655 meters. And, as we can see, the angle is once again 90 degrees between the force and the distance. This gives us a torque from force number two of negative 79.3 newton meters. The negative sign indicating that the torque is clockwise. To find the torque caused by the normal force, we uh, look, consult the formula here and we can see clearly that the distance r from the center to the force is going to be zero. Forces acting at the axis, acting at the pivot point, cause no torque. And so the normal force will cause zero torque. And similarly, the weight force will cause zero torque as well. Because the axis is positioned at the center of the wheel and the weight force can be considered to act at the center of the wheel, the weight force is not going to cause any kind of torque on the wheel. So we have written out formulas and in this case established numbers for all of the torques which are acting on the object. And then our final step is to use Newton's second law to find out what we need to figure out. Well, first, we turn our attention to the first question, which asks for the moment of inertia of the wheel. Since we consider the wheel to be a disk, we use the formula for the moment of inertia of a disk, one-half times the mass times the radius squared. Putting in the appropriate values, we come to a moment of inertia of 3. 0.42 kilogram meters squared. Notice the unusual units on the moment of inertia. Next, we are asked to find the net torque, which is acting on the wheel. Now, net torque has the same meaning as net force. It is the vector sum of all of the torques which are acting on the object. Uh, this, which is why we care about direction and sign. Right, so that is going to be torque number one plus torque number two plus the torque due to the normal force plus the torque due to the weight force. Since we've already calculated the values of these torques, we only need plug in these values and find that the net torque is going to be negative 40 Newton meters, negative 40.0 to three significant figures. Notice the negative sign on the net torque 
That tells us the net torque is going to be clockwise, and that is going to be the direction that the wheel is going to spin. To find this angular acceleration, we now turn to Newton's second law for rotational motion, which states that the sum of the torques is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Well, the sum of the torques, as we've determined, is negative 40 Newton meters, and the moment of inertia determined above is 3.42 kilogram meters squared. This allows us to find the angular acceleration, which is going to be negative 11.7 radians per second squared. Notice again the negative sign. Since the net torque is negative clockwise, that means the angular acceleration will be negative clockwise. Notice this is the angular acceleration without friction. We have had no mention of any friction on the wheel. But what if we introduce a friction force, saying, imagine now that friction causes a torque of 11.2 Newton meters on the wheel. What is the new angular acceleration of the wheel? So we introduce a torque due to friction of 11.2 Newton meters. The first question we have is, what direction will this torque due to friction be? Well, we could not answer that question until we determined what the motion would be without friction. We have seen that without friction, the motion is going to be negative clockwise. That means our torque due to friction is actually going to be positive counterclockwise because friction always opposes motion. If the net torque without friction is clockwise, that means any torque due to friction is going to be counterclockwise. And so we can calculate a new net torque, right, which is going to be all of the torques that we included before with the addition of the torque due to friction. Adding these up is very straightforward, and we arrive at a new value for the net torque of negative 28.8 Newton meters, which is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. The moment of inertia is still 3.42 kilogram meters squared. And so we can calculate a new value for alpha of negative 8.42 radians per second squared with friction. The acceleration with friction is still negative, still clockwise, but it is less with the addition of friction, which is what we would expect.